athletic trainer isn't going to necessarily notice the personality or mood changes because I only see them when I'm treating them or doing an evaluation on them. But you as parents see them every day. They, you see them after school when they come home. So it's very important to notice how your child is doing and important to ask them how they're doing after they sustain an injury. Um, just a few examples of experiences that we may have come across at sports medicine. Um, one is a 13-year-old female that may normally be bubbly and outgoing, and after sustaining a concussion, they are subdued, quiet, and withdrawn. So that's a big thing to recognize after someone sustains a concussion, and it's important to tell someone about what's going on with your child. They also, it also may be the opposite too. You may have a normally subdued, quiet, and well-behaved individual, and after the concussion, they are obnoxious or acting out. It kind of goes along with what Whitney was saying earlier, how she talked about the individual that got hit in the back of the head and became very obnoxious after getting hit. What can you as parents do? It's very important to watch for changes in how your child or teen is acting or feeling, and especially if symptoms are getting worse. You really need to be checking on your athlete constantly about their symptoms and how they're feeling. There are some symptom checklists that are available. You can either get them online or we as athletic trainers can provide them to you. We just need to let you guys know that you maintaining their symptoms should not be in place of seeking medical attention for your athlete. If your child or teen reports symptoms of a concussion or you notice that the symptoms are getting worse, you need to seek medical attention. So if your athlete becomes unresponsive, if they begin vomiting uncontrollably, you need to seek medical attention for that. Children and teens are among the most greater risk for a concussion. It's also very important to support your child throughout the concussion phase. So they may be very frustrated, sad, or even angry that they can't return to play after a concussion, or also that they may not be able to keep up with their schoolwork properly. They may feel isolated from their peers and social networks. So it's important to talk often with your child about how they're doing and offer your support and encouragement where it's needed. Are all concussions the same? Absolutely not. Um, concussions can share certain characteristics, but every concussion is unique to that particular individual and to the actual concussion. So if your child sustains one concussion, and that they sustain a second concussion, that does not mean that the second concussion is going to show similar characteristics as their first concussion. Males and females can also show different symptoms, and age can play a role in the symptoms presented and how long the symptoms may last. Um, a lot of people are, ask us how many symptoms we need to diagnose a concussion, and the answer is we only need one symptom. A blow to the head or body with one persisting symptom is enough for the diagnosis of a concussion. One of the most common misconceptions about the symptoms of a concussion is we'll have a parent or a coach come to us and say, well, my child got hit in the head, but they don't have a headache, so they don't have a concussion. That is absolutely not true. A headache is the most common symptom of a concussion, but that does not mean that every child that sustains a concussion will have a headache with them. Some examples are sled riding, skiing, snowboarding, 
backyard games, borrowing, and even hard labor chores like farming. Also, you may want to monitor usage of video games, television, reading, text messaging, and music. All these activities can cause extra stress on the brain, which may cause symptoms to linger. In the past, Crawford County Sports Medicine has handled cases when symptoms in the child were lingering, and after speaking with the parents and child, we noticed that the child wasn't giving their brain the proper rest due to the constantly being on their phones or playing video games for several hours, which could have been the contributing factor for their lingering symptoms. Some activity modifications, along with what to watch out at home, um, the athlete should be taken out of all sports and physical education classes. Also for those children who are young enough to be in recess, it, sh it should be avoided for, or to be in recess should avoid further activity while experiencing it. Um, symptoms. Academic intervention. Um, and even though your son or daughter is diagnosed with a concussion, in most situations will still need to, be, need to attend their classes so they don't fall behind. Some academic interventions may consist of decreased workload in the class, allow extra time on projects, utilize tape recorders, smart pens, and utilize copies of teacher's notes. Adjust due dates. Um, also, remove or exempt students from tests or large projects, and have them focus on understanding the material. This picture um, basically breaks down and matches symptoms with some examples for interventions that may help your child get through their school day without falling behind or making symptoms worse. Um, if your child is having a headache, blurred vision, or noise sensitivity, wearing sunglasses or putting them in a quiet room will help them. If your child is you know, having concentration problems, slowed, slowed for processing, processing information, um, adjusting their due dates or allowing for extra time may help them. If your child is just mentally fatigued, um, allowing for rest breaks may help them. If your child is, you're noticing your child being more emotional, um, allowing the students to remove him or, him or herself from the room may help them with going through with their concussion. Um, in special circumstances, the Section 504 plan may be needed. Um, it's a federal civil um, rights law under the Rehabil Rehabilitation Act of 1973 which provides protection against discrimination for individuals with disabilities. Um, symptoms that last three or four weeks or longer, athletes may be required to fill out this Section 504 if the student is still having complications in the school setting. This Section 504 plan is typically um, not done through the athletic trainer, um, but may be filled out either through the school nurse or the guidance.
accounts for 40% of all concussions in all age groups, while motor vehicle accidents account for 14.3%. From 2006 to 2010, motor vehicles were the number one cause of concussions in ages 15 to 24. The next few slides are just some sports specifics that I wanted to go through that were important to highlight. Um, so I'll start with cycling. Ages 5 to 14 are seen in the ER for biking injuries more than any other sport. Wearing a helmet can decrease the risk of severe brain injury by 88%, and the proper fitting of that helmet can be just as important. 55% have reported not wearing a helmet. Without a helmet, as little as two feet drop can increase the risk of a concussion. And 50% of those 5 to 14 year olds report that they own a helmet, but only 25% of them report wearing it. Cheerleading and gymnastics, 96% of reported concussions are during stunts and acrobatics. 90% of injuries were fall related, and 36.5% of injuries were to the face or the head. And I think it's important to point out that the fall related injuries might not be because of the girl that's on the top, but the girl that's on the bottom. Um, and can she do a full body weight squat of her own? Can she physically lift enough weight to account for a girl that she's lifting many feet into the air? Um, so that's something important to point out there, as well as only PIAA sanctioned cheer squads have to follow the safety rules. If you look at the picture on the left, that's a stunt that's not allowed in the PIAA sanctioned rules. And here at Sports Medicine, we only see a couple squads that are PIAA sanctioned. So we're actually seeing a lot of squads that don't have to follow those safety rules, which is probably where we see an increase in injuries to the heads from those. Skiing and snowboarding, head trauma accounts for 20% of all downhill injury. 70% of skiers or boarders wear helmets, which is a 5% increase since 2012. New Jersey is the only United States state that mandates all age groups wear a helmet. The Aspen resorts in Colorado mandate 12 years and younger wear a helmet. And it doesn't matter what skill level you are, whether you're professional or a five-year-old, you should wear a helmet at all times. In soccer, 40% of concussions occur head-to-head. 10% occur head-to-object, which includes the ground and 12.6% occur head to the ball. There have been multiple headgears developed, but no research shows any increase in um, benefiting against head injuries. As Whitney had pointed out, even if you had a headgear around your head, it's not gonna stop your brain from moving inside your skull. And then some of the reasons why there might be an increase in concussions in kids younger than 14, are because they started playing organized sport at a younger age. Camps and club sports run all year round. Even if they're in a sport in the winter, they might still be playing a club sport on the side, so they're doubling up sports. And concussions occur in the non-traditional activities, such as recess, that are often overlooked at home.
kind of got kicked in the head, and I don't feel right. They have to let us know that because I'm not going to be able to see the bottom of the pile, what goes on under there. So that's the on-field part of it as far as the clinical evaluation. Um, we feel at sports medicine we've always been just a little bit ahead of the curve with our concussion management. Um, it's going to go through a thorough history. How did the injury happen? What were you doing? What exactly went on? Um, a symptom checklist. We have, like Courtney mentioned, uh, we go through about 22 symptoms and ask them to rate them. Um, six being the worst that they are, one being eh, not really having that symptom. Checking their cognitive abilities. Usually ask them to, um, and give them three words to remember. Ask them immediately if they can remember them. Go through a few other things. Ask those words again for a kind of a delayed memory recall. And we have recently added some cranial nerve and upper quarter neurological screening, balance testing, and some pupil reactivity and convergence. I'm going to just demonstrate some of those just real quick for you. So maybe if you want to prepare help me. Um, there are 12 cranial nerves. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, first one would be asking Abby, can you blink for me? Making sure she can blink. Um, can you smile? Making sure the smile is equal, she's not droopy on one side. Um, asking, can you hear this? Can you hear this? And my favorite, can you stick your tongue out for me? <laughs> Making sure the tongue comes out even, not off to the side, comes out straight. Um, as far as an upper quarter screen, just briefly, maybe ask the athlete to shrug their shoulders. Try to resist here. Make biceps for me. Have you hold nice and tight there and try to pull them over. Don't pull over your heel. Arms out to the side. Again, resist up against me. Good. Fingers out. Hold your fingers out nice and tight there. Trying to squeeze them together on both. And then do the opposite. Keep them in nice and tight. Good. And trying to pull them apart. Just making sure that she's able to do the things that I'm asking. I don't see any major deficit there. As far as balance testing, um, have you, do you feel comfortable on one foot? Have the athlete seen on one foot? Place your hands on your hips. First making sure she can get in the position, then have them close their eyes to test their balance then. So making sure she doesn't fall over. Good. Um, when it talks about um, pupil reactivity, we go by what's pearl, pupils equal and reactive to light. So I have my handy pen light. Just look straight ahead there. Coming in, making sure the pupils react the way they're supposed to. When making sure one's not really lethargic or slower or bigger than the other one. And then as far as convergence testing, you stare at a pen light here and just have just follow the pen light, have the athlete track the light, make sure that she's able to do that, make sure the eyes are going together. One's not doing something different from the other one. So, once diagnosed, what happens? Um, like Courtney and Whitney both said, it only takes one symptom to diagnose a concussion, and that's how they are diagnosed, is based on symptoms. CT scans aren't showing you um, if you have a concussion or not, and I wanted to make sure I mentioned that in the state of Pennsylvania, athletic trainers can actually diagnose a concussion. So, once that happens, we utilize a stepwise progression for full return to play once the athlete is symptom-free. Each step is going to build on the previous one, and the athlete must remain symptom-free throughout each process. So if their headaches come back, kind of put them on pause until their headaches and or symptoms, I shouldn't just say headaches, go away, and then continue through the progression. And then, um, due to new research and le legislation, we've asked that Dr. Wheeling is now, like Mike said, going to be a part of our return to play process. Um, just want to touch briefly, we do utilize neurocognitive testing, namely the impact test. We have used this since 2005. I know in the last few years it's been kind of the buzzword even in the NFL. It's not a new thing. We've been doing it since 2005. And uh, based on the importance of it and the information that it does provide to us, Mevo Medical Center has provided the subscriptions to the IMPACT program that we use in our, um, the 10 high schools that we cover. Important to note that um, the IMPACT test that we currently have is actually designed for athletes kids age 11 plus. Um, we've been told for many years that they're working on a pediatric version. We haven't seen that yet. So we do use it on kids age 11 plus, but that doesn't mean we can't manage the concussion without using impact because it doesn't diagnose the concussion. It is a tool that we use to manage the concussion.